أصحابه أجمعين وعلى من تمسك بسنته بإحسان إلى يوم الدين ثم أما بعض فإن خير الكلام كلام الله وخير الهدى هدى رسول الله صلى الله عليه وسلم وشر الأمور محدثاتها وكل محدثة بدعة وكل بدعة ضلالة وكل ضلالة في النار As we mentioned, we're going to deal with one of the classic books that was authored by one of the great muhaddithin of this ummah, one of the sahib al-kutub al-sitta, the six books, al-imam al-tirmidhi. And his book is called Al-Shama'il al-Muhammadiyya. Al-Shama'il al-Muhammadiyya. And this book was authored, as many other books were written in this vein by the ulama of Islam because of this significant subject matter that is dealing with. Everyone knows a person's happiness, his success in the darin, the dunya and the akhira. It depends upon his connection. It depends upon his following. It depends upon his closeness, his love, his commitment, to Prophet Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa ala alihi wa sallam. You're not a real Muslim if you don't know how to look at him and how to deal with him. And that's why, although it distresses us, we don't like it, but in a way we laugh at the Charlie Hebdo people who are going to receive a grievous reward, Yom al because of what they did. Hadith that you should remember Always remember when these people choose to disrespect Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam or any prophet or messenger of Allah sallallahu wa sallam alayhim is that he said inna ashadd al-nas adhabin yawm al-qiyamati rajulun qatala nabiyan aw qatalahu nabiyun the person who's going to get the worst punishment yawm al-qiyamah will be a man who killed a nabi or the Nabi killed him. So we understand from that, that if a person killed a Nabi or Rasul, then this is the worst murder that you can possibly commit on the face of the earth. Committing a murder in which a man kills his father, kills his brother, kills his son, his daughter, that's serious. But killing a Nabi is the worst crime and the worst murder that you can commit. Killing innocent people, people from Daesh don't understand that. Killing people who you have an agreement with, you have an agreement with them that don't harm me and you have your protection. And then you come and you make ghadr and you kill them. That's why it's from the Akbar al Kabair. But in terms of murder, the worst murder that can be committed is the murder against a Nabi or Rasul because that murder is, in essence, a person saying he wants to murder Allah. He wants to fight with Allah. Because that Nabi and that Rasul has been sent and commissioned by Allah Azza wa Jal. When does Allah destroy Ya'juj and Ma'juj? Ya'juj and Ma'juj, they allowed to make fitna and fasad in the earth. And then after making so much fitna and fasad, they're going to say amongst themselves, because they're going to have al ghurur They're going to say, we killed all of mankind. We killed everybody. Nobody can deal with us. Even Isa ibn Maryam, when Ya'juj and Ma'juj come, he's going to go the other way. He's going to flee, go the other way with the mu'minin on that day because he can't deal with what they're bringing to the table in terms of quwa. So Ya'juj and Ma'juj are going to look and say, we dealt with everybody in the earth. Now let's deal with those who are in the heavens. Meaning Allah and the malaika. And when they go beyond that boundary, they are destroyed. So the person who kills the Nabi in essence is saying, I want to kill Allah, I want to oppose Allah, I want to fight Allah. So when those people draw pictures and they talk bad about him, sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, it's distressing. But at the same time, we're laughing because the one who dies on that stuff is going to have a serious punishment, yawm al So what did the scholars of Islam do? Because a person's success in the darin, the dunya and the akhirah, it hinges upon his knowledge, his love, his commitment, his connection to the Nabi sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. 
the scholars did their job to put in front of the community everything that they needed to know about our Nabi and our Rasul al-Mustafa al-Mukhtar sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. So they wrote books in this regard. And all of these books are from the same family, but they are specialized. And this is one of the specialized books that we're going to deal with. If you want to know about the Nabi sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, the scholars came, they wrote about his seerah, the books of his story, his life. What happened? How he was born? How was he in Mecca? How it was when he became a Nabi and a Rasul on the mountain sallallahu alayhi wa sallam? How Quraysh did what they did to him? How he made hijrah to al-Medina? And all of those things that happened over the 23-year period of his life. Like the seerah of the Nabi by an Imam ibn Hisham, an Imam al-Tabari, ibn al-Jawzi, ibn al-Athir. Anybody wants to know the seerah about his life is there. That's one type of way of getting to know the Nabi sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. And if you didn't read a book of seerah yet, then you're falling short of the mark. You have to have some kind of concept and knowledge about how his religion went. Also from these books in this vein that were written so that people will come to know about Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam are the books that prove his prophecy. And it was about his life and his dawah. They call those books Dala'il and nabuwa The Dalil, Dala'il and nabuwa The proof that he was a prophet. Al-Imam Al-Bayhaqi probably wrote the best book in this regard in which he brought a lot of the proofs that show that Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam was a Nabi. No reason for his dawah to be rejected because he said too many things. The Quran mentioned too many things. Too many things happen with yaqeen to show this man is divinely sent and inspired by Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And no one rejects him except an anid, mustakbir, mutakabbir, zalim li nafsihi. Nobody rejects him. Because there are too many proofs. And from those proofs is another type of book that scholars wrote. They wrote books about his mu'jizat, just his miracles, because every single prophet was sent with a miracle or a set of miracles. Why? As the Nabi said, sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, so that the people would believe in his message. So that the people would believe in his message. So all of the prophets and messengers came with miracles. None of them came with just kalam. Nice kalam and nice dawah. And articulating la ilaha illallah and the adab of Jahannam, and the na'im of the Jannah. They didn't come with that only. All of them came with a Nabi. The hadith said, مَا مِن نَبِيًّا إِلَّا أُوْتِيَ مِنَ الْآيَاتِ مَا آمَنَا بِهَا الناس. There is no Nabi came, except that he was given ayat. That because of those ayat, those mu'jizat, people believed in him. If he just came out and started saying, hey people, believe in La ilaha Allah, I'm a good person and I behave well and you know how I am. I don't lie, I don't steal, I don't cheat. That may help some people to follow and to believe. But that's not enough for everybody. So what that prophet would do, by Allah's permission, he would cause the dead to come alive. Be even in that. He would cause a bird, after making it out of clay, turn into a bird and fly away. He would have a naqa and he would tell the people, don't bother this naka. You mess with this naka. You, you, you hamstring it. There's a serious penalty to pay. So the point is, the scholar of Islam, in giving the people an opportunity to know the Nabi and the Rasul, sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, they wrote those books about his mu'jizat, al-isra wal mi'raj, the mu'jiza of the Quran, and so forth and so on. And from these books, ikhwani, that come from the same family and from the same vein is this type of book that we're going to deal with, inshallah, in our Wednesday class. The books that are called Ash-Shama'il Al-Muhammadiyya or Ash-Shama'il. And this word Ash-Shama'il, it means a person's akhlaq. It means a person's adab, his adab. It means everything about that person, how he spoke, how he looked, how he walked, how he did everything. When it came to the Shama'il of the Nabi sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, different scholars wrote about this issue. For an example, Al-Imam al-Baghwi, 
that tremendous great scholar of the Shafi'i Madhab, the one who wrote Sharh al-Sunnah, tremendous scholar in Al-Islam from the Ulama of the Salaf. His book of the Shama'in is probably the Osa, the widest one, the biggest one. Talked about everything you needed to know about the Prophet Wasallam. His sweat, the khatam of the Nabuwa. They even talked about his circumcision, Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. When he was born, was he circumcised or what is he not circumcised? Sallallahu alayhi wa ala alayhi wa sallam. Talked about every single thing you need to know about him in order to get the person close and in the circle of what he needs to know because there's many reasons why we learn this knowledge. It's not a simple issue. And from those scholars as well as Imam Ibn Kathir, Ibn Kathir, he went a little further. He wrote about the utensils of the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. His utensils, like the thing he would keep his perfume in, his bowl, his fork, his spoon, things like that. And the reason why he wrote about that and included it with his akhlaq and his adab is because it meant something to the companions. When the khawarij, the forefathers, the ajdad of Daesh and Boko Haram and Shabab and these people, when their ajdad were making takfir, against the companions. And when they were about to make khuruj, and they were about to fight against the companions, and they were in the masjid, making dhikr, that circle, that circle, that circle, that circle, and they were doing an innovation when the companions were there with them. Just ask the companions if you don't know. Abdullah ibn Mas'ud, may Allah be pleased with him. When he came and he made inkar, he said, hey you people, hey, hey, hey. Take those pebbles that you're making dhikr with and count your sins with them. Because I guarantee you if you were doing the right thing, Allah wouldn't cause your deeds to be lost. He said, look, the companions of the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam are here in Medina, mutawafirun. They're all over. You want to know the religion? Go to them. And then he said, and this is the point, he said, his clothes are still hanging up. They're not dry. And his utensils are not broken. Meaning... He just died recently. Sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. Why are you innovating in the deen? He just died recently. But look at the fiqh of Abdullah ibn Mas'ud. The actual clothes of the Nabi sallallahu alayhi wa sallam meant something to him. So he used that as a delil and a hujjah. His bowl, his plate meant something. He said his bowls, his utensils, they're not even broken yet. Right now, 1,436 years ago, after the fact, his bowls, utensils, they're lost. Not to mention that they're broken, but during that time, if you know, if you want to know what is the Sa' and Nabawi, what is the Mud and Nabawi, any companion can go into his house and bring out that and say, This is the measurement, because this belonged to the Nabi. Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. So Al Imam ibn Kathir, he brought all of that. So the point here, Khwani, is these books about his Shama'il, they were written by many scholars, many scholars. And to sit here and give you all those names, it would be redundant, but we just want to bring this point to your attention. One of the best books written in Islam by Ibn al-Qayyim out of all of his books is the book called Zad al-Ma'ad. Zad al-Ma'ad. Someone wants to know the fiqh of al-Jihad without getting deep into it like you find in the books of fiqh. Whether that book of fiqh is fiqh that's comparative and maqarin, or whether it's fiqh of a madhab. You go to any book of the madhab, you're going to find the bab of al-jihad. And it's deep. Sometimes complicated. It's not for everybody. And maybe the book is big. Maybe the book is middle. Maybe the book is small. But it's a lot to know about al-jihad. Ibn al-Qayyim, in this book, Zad al-Ma'ad, he brings the four types of jihad, the four levels of jihad. Anyone who wants to get a good comprehension of jihad today and what we should be doing and not doing all he has to do is look at that book. He wants to learn about different aspects of the sunnah, of whatever, that book. But the point is, in that book, Zad al-Ma'ad, the very first chapter, the very first chapter, the kitab is about the shama'il of the Nabi, sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, where he talked about what's his name, what's his lineage, when was he born, his mother, his father. They talk about who were all of his slaves, they talk about his children. Talk, he talked about everything you need to know. Why? Because in knowing him, the more you know, the more it's going to benefit you. And the darim, as you're going to see. So that's what we're dealing with in this class. We're not just dealing with some descriptions of the Prophet 
This type of class is a class in which books were written on this because the ulama of Islam, they paid attention to it. A person comes and he says, I saw the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam in a dream last night. And mashallah, he brought me a dish. And then he picked the dish up. And inside it was a beautiful woman, mashallah. And he told me, this is going to be your wife and you're going to get married soon. And then the person says, yes, I saw the Nabi sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. And that's a sign I'm going to get married. And then he tells us that story. He says, mashallah, mashallah. What did the prophet look like? And the person said, he looked Somali. He looked like a Somali from the south. We're going to say to him, no brother, you didn't see the Nabi sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. Because the companions described the Nabi to us in perfect detail. And he didn't look like Somali people. So that was a shaitan that came to you. You ate too much. Something happened, but it wasn't the Nabi. So knowing Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, especially in this bab of khurafat of dreams, it helped an individual to figure out a lot of things. So the next issue we want to deal with, Khwani, is what's the benefit of learning such a topic? Why did the scholars write about it? Why is it important? Because when we ask, what class do you want to do next? You won't find the people saying, let's do the Shama'i and Muhammadiyah for different reasons. That's no criticism against anybody. But what is it that made the ulama write about this issue and what's the benefit of it? There are a lot of benefits. Just to name a few, inshallah ta'ala, from them is, it is wajib, not only wajib, but it's from the awjib al-wajibat. Most wajib thing. For everybody to have al iman in the Rusul, Salawatullahi wa Salamu alayhim ajma'in. It's wajib that you have to believe in the prophets and the messengers, all of them. And talking bad about one is like talking bad about all of them. Rejecting one is rejecting all of them. Kadhabat qawmu nuh al mursaleen. Noah's people rejected all of the mursaleen. Although Noah was the first and only Rasul that came to them, they didn't meet Lot, Hud, Saleh, Shu'i, they didn't meet any of them. Salawatullahi wa salamu alayhim ajma'in. But when Nuh came to them and they rejected him, they rejected every other one. Allah Ta'ala mentioned in the Quran. Amen al Rasulu bima unzila ilayhi min rabbihi wal mu'minun. Kurun amen abilahi wa mala ikatihi wa kutubihi wa rasuli. No differences between any of them. So, Charlie Hebdo, if a person were to talk bad about Isa ibn Maryam, if a person were to say, as we hear some of these people say, Isa ibn Maryam was, and he could have been, and he may come back as a homosexual, the Muslim is going to say, A'udhu billahi. We're going to get upset. And we're going to defend the honor of that Nabi because they all came from the same mishkat, from the same yanbur, from the same source, from the same well. So since it is from the ojab al wajibat to have iman, to believe in them, then it is even more so to come to know about Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. It's from al-iman. Look at this. When the person dies, Munkar and Nakia comes to him and says, Men, Rabbuka. He'll say, Rabbi Allah, Ma Dinuka. He'll say, Dini al Islam. What did you say about that man who came to you? He's going to say, He's Abdullah wa Rasuluhu. And he'll get Najat, Al Iman, from the Asul of Al Iman. Bainama, you find the other jahil, munafiq, he'll come. Man rabbuka, I don't know. Madinuka, I don't know. What do you have to say about that man who came? He's going to say, I heard people saying something, so I said what they said. But he doesn't know. Those two angels will say, ma talait, for ma darait. You didn't read, so you don't know. And they're going to hit him in the back of the nape of his neck right here. The Prophet says, Sallallahu Alaihi wa Alaihi wa Sallam, if Allah allowed you people to hear his scream, you wouldn't bury any of your dead. Even if you thought that the dead person you were burying was religious, because you don't want to put him in that situation. But Allah didn't allow Benny, Benny, Benny Adam to hear that scream. So the fact and the point here is, 
Knowing about the Nabi sallallahu alayhi wa sallam is from Al-Iman. It's from Al-Iman. That you're going to be asked about him. And if you say, ha ha, la adri. I heard them saying something, so I said similar. It's not going to be enough. Number two, from the many reasons, is that Allah Ta'ala has made it wajib upon us to love Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa ala alihi wa sallam. We have to love him. We have to have muhabba for the Nabi sallallahu alayhi wa ala alihi wa sallam. And what was collected by Imam al-Bukhari, a Muslim, Anas ibn Malik, may Allah Ta'ala be pleased with him, he said that the Nabi says, sallallahu alayhi wa ala alihi wa sallam, thalafun man kunna fihi wajada halawat al-Iman. An yakun Allahu wa rasooluhu ahabu ilayhi mimma siwahima. Three things, if any person finds these three things, he would taste the sweetness of Al-Iman. And the very first thing he mentioned was that Allah and his messenger are more beloved to him than everything else. Than everything else, bar nothing. Anything you can think of, anything you can think of, Allah and his messenger is more beloved to him than everything else. His car, his job, his child. His health, his self, Allah and his messenger. Anyone who has that, then that individual will taste halawat al-iman. He mentioned in another hadith, Anas ibn Malik, said Bukhari wa Muslim, the Nabi sallallahu alayhi wa sallam said, لا يؤمن أحدكم حتى أكون أحب إليه من والده وولده والناس أجمعين. None of you has true iman until he loves me more than he loves his mother, his father, his children, and his own self. His own self. So how do you love someone if you don't know who the individual was? You don't know about the individual. You don't know what he did. And that's why I say, Khwani, especially for you younger brothers, your fathers are on the scene, and your fathers are living with you, and you have relationships with your father. You should ask your father, where did you come from? Who are you? Who were your friends? How was life for you growing up? Have some knowledge about your father and what happened with your father. That's from our religion. When I ask some of our young, young people, where are you from? And he tells me, I'm from Sweden. And he says, I'm from Germany. He says things like that. I'm from the UK. I always say, don't say that. Let what comes out of the kid's mouth is where he's originally from. And we don't apologize for being American and British. We're here to stay, and we don't apologize. We're not second-class citizens, but I'm from Africa. I'm from this place. I'm from that place. And I don't want to lose my identity. So the point is, where does that come from? Al-Asabiya? Al-Unsariya? Al-Hizbiya? No, it comes from, how are you going to love someone if you don't know about where he is, who he was, what he did? So that's the second reason. You don't know how to love something, someone correctly, if you don't know about him. You don't know about the Nabi sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, your love for him is going to be compromised. Number three, number three, the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam has more rights and he, we owe him more than we owe anyone else. Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam has more rights over everybody here. You and I, we are in debt to him more than we're in debt to our mothers and fathers. Now, when our mothers de- delivered us, may Allah have mercy upon the ones that died from Al-Islam, cure the ones who are sick, and guide the ones who are not Muslims and have mercy on those people. When our mothers carried us and gave birth to us, they made a lot of tremendous efforts, a lot, sacrifices, I mean a lot. Their f- sacrifices don't equal what the Prophet did for us, sallallahu alayhi wa Or he would have told us, your mother has more right to be loved than he does. Maybe he's second or third. He said, you have to love him more than your mother. Because he made more sacrifices than your mother for you. And what was collected by Imam al-Bukhari, Abu Huraira radiallahu anhu, he said that the Prophet said to the people, sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, ma min mu'min, إِلَّا وَأَنَا أَوْلَى بِهِ فِي الدُّنْيَا وَالْآخِرَةِ 
اقرؤوا ان شئتم قول الله تعالى النبي اولى بالمؤمنين من انفسهم he said there is not a nabi there is not a muslim there is not a mu'min not a single person except that i'm closer to him he owes me more he's indebted to me more than anyone else he owes me he's indebted to me no mu'min if he's a mu'min then he's indebted to me if he's a kafir if he's a kafir he didn't believe in the nabi sallallahu alaihi wasallam so maybe he's not indebted as such but if you are a muslim no muslim exists except that the prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam he's indebted to the nabi sallallahu alaihi wasallam in the dunya and in the hereafter he said read if you want the statement of allah in surah al-ahzab the nabi is closer to the believers than their own selves meaning aula bil mu'minin means that they owe him more he has more rights over him over them why why is that why is that first of all the sacrifices that he made to spread this religion your mother my mother all of the mothers of the dunya if they deliver children who die on kufr the sacrifices of their mother it doesn't help them one bit but if they die on al islam they're going to go to jannah and how did they die on islam prophet muhammad made sacrifices for them sallallahu alaihi wasallam all of the khair that you know all of the good all of the evil that you know the good that will get you into jannah the evil that will send a person to the hell fire that you have to avoid all of that how do we know it we know it from the prophet sallallahu alaihi wa ala alihi wasallam he gave nasiha he was gentle he taught in the best way he put everything on the line to help the people So as a result of that if you were muslim mu'min then you owe the nabi hey your mother and your father some of you right now have bad relationships with your parents why because your parents are different they're diff- diff- difficult people some people hate their parents so some parents they fell the child some parents take care of the situation but some parents they fell the child rasulullah never failed anybody sallallahu alayhi wa ala alihi wasallam so as a result of that the ayat of the quran said an nabiy aula bil mu'minin min anfusihim he is closer to them they owe him more than they owe anybody else because getting to jannah goes through him sallallahu alayhi wasallam he is and he said in the dunya and the akhirah you want to live a hayat tayyiba then just learn the religion and you go ahead and you live the hayat tayyiba yawm al qiyamah you deserve to go into the hell fire but he's going to step in and he's going to say ya allah i want to make shifa i want to give my intercession for this one so he doesn't go to the hell fire and he deserved to go for all of what he used to do or what he didn't do so the nabi sallallahu alaihi wasallam has every right that the muslim comes to know as much as he can possibly know about him don't be ignorant to that degree well, he doesn't know except a fraction of what should be known and that fraction is not enough to navigate through the trials and tribulations of the dunya why did the scholars write the books of ash-shama'il and why do we study about these details about our nabi and our rasul sallallahu alaihi wasallam allah ta'ala has made him a qudwa allah made him a qudwa this word qudwa means someone to be followed he's a qudwa i see Malcolm X, Al Hajj, Malik, Shabazz, Malcolm X. I see him as an imam for African American Muslims especially. When that brother from America, his name is Tahir Wyatt, Abu Abdul Razak, Hafizullah, when he received the chair to give classes in the Prophet's Masjid sallallahu alaihi wasallam and I heard about it I talked about that incident here in this masjid because I thought it was a monumental achievement on his part and it was an example for every African American revert Muslim or any Muslim who was born from the African American um racial group goes to show hey you are reverting this that this brother is the first human being to teach in the prophet's masjid sallallahu alaihi wasallam but that brother stands on the shoulders of Malcolm X 
Do I say that Malcolm X is an imam, a qudwa, because he had a lot of knowledge? No, I don't, he didn't have a lot of knowledge. Rahimahullah ta'ala. But he's an example to be followed for African Americans, especially Muslims, in his sacrifices, in his sincerity, insha'Allah, in his love for his people, in his willingness to put his life down for what he believed in, for his people and his message. He's a qudwa. He's an example. He's an imam. When it comes to don't blindly follow, that man almost single-handedly built the nation of Islam and he had power. But when he saw the truth for what it was, he called a spade a spade and it ultimately cost his, his life. He didn't tap dance for people. He was clear about what his dawah was, what his religion is. And that's a good and honorable characteristic to have. So the people of the sunnah, you have to be clear that you're trying to be on the sunnah from the sunnah. And don't be a wishy-washy type of person. So having hikmah is one thing, but being a person who's apologetic is another thing. That's a problem. So anyway, Allah Azza wa Jal made Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam an example. لَقَدْ كَانَ لَكُمْ فِي رَسُولِ اللَّهِ أُسْوَةٌ حَسَنًا لِمَنْ كَانَ يَرْجُ اللَّهَ وَالْيَوْمِ الْآخِرِ وَذَكَرَ اللَّهَ كَثِيرًا Verily you have in Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam a perfect uswa, qudwa. He's a perfect example for the one who believes and thinks about yawm al-qiyamah and for the one who thinks about Allah and mentions Allah brings a lot to mind, and so forth and so on. So if he's an example, how is he going to be an example if you're ignorant about him? How are we going to follow him if we're ignorant about him? No, you have to follow him. You have to learn about him in order to follow him. If you don't learn about him, then you'll fall prey and you'll be susceptible to doing what the Prophet described is going to happen during this time, sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. على كل رأس على كل سبيل منها شيطان يدو إليها when he drew those lines from the Surat al-Mustaqim he said there would be shayateen callers on each line inviting people to come and to get off the Surat al-Mustaqim so the person goes because he doesn't know what the Surat al-Mustaqim is <laughs> Abdullah bin Mas'ud said كان الناس يسألون رسول الله صلى الله عليه وسلم من الخير the other companions used to ask about all of the good things. I used to ask about the bad things because I was afraid if I fall into the bad thing, I would be, I would, I would be destroyed. So his statement goes to show if you know what light is, you'll know what the opposite is. If you know what the khayr is, then you know what the opposite of khayr is. But if you don't know what light is, you don't know, you don't know what darkness is, and so forth and so on. So things are known from the opposites. You come to know about Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, you position yourself to be able to follow him correctly. Another issue that's very important. From the books that were written about his shakhsiya, his personality, sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, are those books that talk about Sending salat and salams upon him, sallallahu alayhi wa ala alihi wa sallam. One of the reasons why we study about him is the more that a person knows about who the Nabi was, sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, what he did, what he went through, you'll find that's the individual who says, sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, more than everybody else. That's usually the case. If he doesn't know very much about him, he'll become tired of saying sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. He'll be negligent about saying salawatullahi wa sallam alayhi. How many people it is part of their repertoire, part of their existence as Muslims, that on a Friday when it comes, he makes it his action to take the time out just to say sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. Everybody here at the salat, Everybody, inshallah, he said, Astaghfirullah, 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 Allahumma anta salamu ila akhiri. Subhanallah. So everybody said that at one point or another. Everybody. Does he do it for every prayer? No. He's still struggling and striving to do it for every prayer because of the virtues that are in that. Okay, but he did it. 
how many people in the majlis on Friday took the time out just to say sallallahu alayhi wasallam because he was told do this on Friday and do it a lot. The one who knows about him, the one who studied about him, the one who lived with him as a result of studying with him, you'll find that he's the one who's saying it more than other people, sallallahu alayhi wasallam. And this is just a natural thing. And this is a thing that Ahlul Hadith used to have in the past. Because the people of innovation, they used to get upset when the sheikh would start teaching about the hadith. And Imam al-Tirmidhi, he would start teaching the hadith. Whatever hadith he learned. So he would say, so-and-so told me, that so-and-so told him, that so-and-so informed him, that Abu Huraira radiallahu anhu said, that the Prophet wasallam said this or this or that. And they would go through the whole thing like that. And it's tedious and it takes time. And it takes consistency, persistence. It takes some effort. People of innovation, they didn't like Alul Hadith. So they'll say, In a matter, how long are you people going to say Hadithani? How long are you going to keep going to just get to the point? But the people of Alul Hadith remained on that. Because it was one of the simat of Alul Hadith. That chain of narration is part of what saved our religion from what happened to the Yehud and the Nasara. Or any ignorant person standing up saying, God said this and God said that. And we say to him, where's the proof of that? And he has nothing to prove it. It's just some nonsense. But in this religion, it was that chain of narration. And at the end of the chain or the beginning... The culmination of the chain was the salat and the salams on Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa ala alayhi wa sallam. So one of the athar, the ta'thir, the effect, the impact of learning about him is giving him that haq. And ikhwani, this issue of giving salams and salat upon him is something we shouldn't be ignorant about. Again, the scholars wrote books about this issue so that we can get fiqh about it. Fiqh that some of us don't even know. Serious issues. For an example, he said that the abkhal al-raju, the most stingiest man, the Arabs of Jahiliyyah, the Arabs, being bakhil is a sifat as a dhamima. Don't be stingy with the Arab. If you're known as a stingy problem, he said the most stingiest person is the one who, when I mention, he can't even say sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. He said, the Muslim does not sit in any majlis and he doesn't say sallallahu alayhi wa sallam upon me except that yawm al qiyamah, that majlis that he sat in, will come and it will be a cause of grief for him because he's supposed to say that at every majlis. When he starts work, he says sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, start and work. He goes in the classroom. He says, Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam when he starts school. And if he doesn't, Yawm Al-Qiyamah, each and every majlis of those majalis in his life will come back and he'll see it and it's going to haunt him. In dua to Allah. Allah, dua. If you just started saying with ikhlas, Oh Allah, forgive me, I made a mistake. And then you do dua al-istighfar. Sayyid al-istighfar. Allahumma anta rabbi la ilaha illa anta khalaqtani. And you just started making dua. And I make tawbah of what I did. But you didn't say sallallahu alayhi wa sallam before you started your dua. Then your dua is naqis. The Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam is one of the doors to the paradise. Like your mother, like your father. They're from the doors of al-jannah. The husband is from the door of Jannah for her. Her husband is a door to Jannah. The child that died in infancy is a door to Jannah. Fasting is a door to Jannah. Jihad is a door to Jannah. Many abwab. They are doors to Jannah. Yawm al-Qiyamah Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam will knock on the door of Jannah. The angel will allow him in. He'll be the first one to get in. And then after him, he'll get the other people in. And the people will say, Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, will be closer to him than obviously the people who didn't. I don't say the people who did this sunnah, the people who did this wajib issue, this ibadah that was wajib. 
ان الله وملائكته يصلون على النبي يا ايها الذين امنوا صلوا عليه وسلموا تسليما this is a command from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala so why do we study the more you study about him and you appreciate and learn about him the more you're going to say it inshallah ta'ala from the reasons as well ikhwani and they are a lot but we'll stop with this one or maybe two from those reasons is that this is what the salaf used to do the companions radiyallahu anhum and the tabi'un and the atba' the tabi'in and we've been commanded to follow the way of the salaf السابقون الاولون من المهاجرين والانصار والذين اتبعوهم باحسان رضي الله عنهم ورضوا عنه got to follow the sabiqun al awwalun so it was their practice and many things they used to do that was a part of their existence it has died for an example they were sitting here like you're sitting rasulullah came out to them sallallahu alaihi wasallam and he said what are you doing they say ya rasulullah inna natadhakiru as-sa'a we're talking amongst ourselves about yawm al-qiyamah we're collectively discussing yawm al-qiyamah what's going to happen and how this and how that reminding each other and then he said no for surety it won't be established until these things happen then he started telling them about some of the major signs so the point here is they used to sit and they would discuss that amongst themselves in the hadith sahih al-bukhari muslim ibn abbas said that the nabi sallallahu alaihi wasallam said 70000 people going to jannah without any adab without any hisab after telling them that without telling them who they were he got up and he went into his house they sat and said hey i think it's these people i think it's the companions he said no i think it's the people who were born in islam and they never made sins he said hey i think it's the people who are memorizers of the quran he said no i think it's the people who made jihad and defended islam so amongst themselves they were sitting making al mudhakira reminding themselves today the people make their mudhakira subhanallah and they take this statement from the salaf the salaf used to say sufyan athawri was saying to someone one of the ulama of the past ahmed ibn hanbal was saying to ali al madini taal li nakhtab sa'atan come come let's make ghiba for an hour let's make ghiba and what al imam ahmed and ali madini meant was let's talk about the men of the hadith so that we can stay sharp about who's acceptable and who's rejected so that statement is there the salaf used to sit and make ghiba so the person says taal taal let's make ghiba for an hour going lay mubtadi and that one mubtadi the salaf used to do that ya khi subhanallah so the companions they used to tell the people as you're going to see inshallah in this book shama'il al muhammadiya ali ibn abi talib the hadith is coming in the first chapter amr ibn al as amr ibn al as told the people when they asked him describe the nabi to us the tabi'un describe the nabi to us he said look i used to hate him so much i hated him in jahili i hated him i wanted to kill him but when i became a muslim i loved him so much and i respected him so much i didn't look at him in like that i kept my head down and i didn't look at him i had haiba i was afraid of him the respect the respectful fear he said so go ask someone else because i can't describe him and that happened with many of the companions many of them one of them that i share with you is what happened with al hasan al hasan ibn ali ibn abi talib رضي الله عنهم he says سألت خالي هند ابن ابي هالا ان حليه النبي صلى الله عليه وسلم لعلي اتعلق بها he said i ask pay attention al hasan the son of ali he said i ask my maternal uncle my khal my mother's brother fatima's brother I asked my uncle tell me about the hilia and hilia here means the beauty tell me about the beauty of the nabi sallallahu alaihi wasallam because i need something to hold on to meaning 
I want to learn about it. Tell me about his beauty so I can learn about it. And then he went on to describe to him how the Prophet looked, sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, how his hair was, how his shoulders were, and so forth and so on. So it's a sign and an indication that the companions used to learn about those details. There's something about this man, Hinda ibn Abi Hala, that I want to bring to your attention. First of all, Ikhwani, his mother was Khadija bint Khuwaylid, the first wife of our Nabi and our Rasul sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, and the first woman that believed in Al Islam, maybe the first person that believed in Islam after Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. So, Hind, uh, Khadija was married before Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, and she had this man. His name was Hind. So since Khadija is his mother, Khadija is also Fatima's mother, but from a different father, sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. So Hind is the khal of the son of Fatima, Hassan. It's his maternal uncle. The other thing about Hind is this name Hind is a woman's name commonly amongst the Arabs. If a man from amongst us called his son Hind, people are going to make a stinkar. They're going to say, hey, hey, why you give your son a woman's name? It's like the non-Muslims. If you call a man Sally, Julie, Nancy, Vanessa, people are going to say, what? Where, where, where did you get that name from, Vanessa? You people, where, what was on their mind? It's out of place. Hind is like that to the Arabs today. But the Arabs of Jahiliya Kalla, Hind is one of those names in the Arab naming system that can be on the boy and it can be on a girl. Prophet Muhammad sallallahu alaihi wasallam, his wife Hind, the daughter of Abu Sufyan. Hind is for the boy. Hind is for the girl. And Arabs they have a few names like that. Another name like Asma. Asma is a name for a boy, as many of the companions, the men, that was their name. But it's more shuhra, more maruf that it is a woman's name, a woman's name. So here, when the grandson of the Prophet who saw him, sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, and he knew him, but he was very young. Here's an individual who is older than him, who spent more time with him. He said to him, tell me about the beauty of Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam so that I can learn about it, something that I can hang on. So it goes to show learning about his Shama'il is something that the Salaf al-Salih, Radwan Allah alayhim, used to do. From the companions and the tabi'in and the atba at tabi'in. There are some more reasons, but we're going to start right here, inshaAllah ta'ala. And we ask Allah Azza to give us the tawfiq and to give us the khair of the dunya and the akhirah. And that he raises us up, yawm al-qiyamah, from amongst the zumrah of those people who are the ansar of the sunnah of the Nabi. Sallallahu alayhi wa sallam Those people who took him as a qudwa Even if we make mistakes And even if we have a taqseer We ask Allah to open up the doors of al-jannah Not to make people fitness for us In our deen Hada wa sallallahu wa sallam Wa barik ala nabiyyina Wa ala alihi wa ashabihi ajma'in Wa salamu alaykum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh Hey, um, Hassan, you ready? Where's Asghar? Hmm? All right, get that guy. Where's uh, Brother Afdal's friend? You guys have any questions, Akhwani? Just one question, if there's a question. Dr. Abu Hanifa, Faddal. On Friday, Akhwani, or at any time, any way, you can send the Durood al-Sharif on Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa ala alayhi wa sallam. Because he taught the companions different ways. They taught, he taught them different ways. So you could say, sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, as-salatu wa salam alayhi, or any sira that you can think of, any formula that you're saying the same thing. As long as you know what you're saying and you're sending a salat and the salams upon him. 
So you don't have to say it any special way at any given time. Anything is okay. Any more questions? Okay, then, Ikhwani. Ahsanu Allah ilaykum wa baraka wa fikum. They have the thing that I'm giving the khutbah this week here at Green Lane. That's not true. Someone else is going to give it this week. Hopefully, Dr. Ahsan Hanif, I'll be giving it the week after. Bi-idhnillah. Assalamu alaikum. Where's your friend at? Afdan. Where's my brother at? That's him? Are you okay, Abu Isa? Zakaria. How are you, my man? Good, man. Good to see you. Khalid. I'm good, Akhiya. Alhamdulillah. How's everything? Abu Zakaria. How are you? Good to see you. Barakallah. This is Shamsun. Shamsun. How are you, Akhi Kareem? Are you all right? Assalamu alaikum. Shamsu, come on, let's go, man. 